So y'all say amen good and loud now. Amen. Amen. So they'll know there's more people here. <laughs> but uh, good to see each of you here today, this Sunday. All right, Matthew chapter uh, 27. Matthew chapter 27. And uh, we're going to start reading verse number um, 11. And uh, read towards uh, the end of the chapter here. Not the whole thing, but we're going to read some of it here. Uh, Matthew 27, verse number 11. Uh, the Bible says this, And Jesus stood before the governor. Of course, that's Pilate. And the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. Now at that and now at that uh, feast, the governor was wont, that means he was of the habit of doing this, to release unto the people the prisoner whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. And uh, if, you, if you know the story, I hope you do. Uh, of course, uh, G, uh, Pilate presents uh, Jesus and Barabbas and says, which one do you want? And the crowd chooses Barabbas and says to let Jesus die, to be crucified. Verse 26. So then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers, and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had planted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote, on, smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were come to, unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say the place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. Uh, Golgotha here, this place they take him to, is uh, also in, in, uh, in the book of Luke, it's called Calvary. Calvary. So we sing at Calvary. We sing that song in our book, and in our song books, and we talk about Calvary. And uh, that's what this is talking about. It's a place of a skull. It's a place of death. It's a place where they crucified uh, the criminals. And Jesus Christ dies here on Golgotha, also known as Calvary. By the way, if you don't have a King James Bible, you don't have Calvary. It's only the King James Bible. Uh, verse 35, And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots. Now, when you think about this, they crucified him. Uh, that's just three words, but there's a lot of things that go into those three words. Yeah. They crucified him. You've got to think about the procedure itself, the method itself, all the things that went into this. And uh, if you heard any preacher or read anything about it, you know that it was a very horrible way to die. And they crucified him. And let me just say this. Um, I, I, the other day, Sister Brenda uh, called our house and said she saw a man on a cross going home the other day. Did you? And so I drove up there to see what was going on, and there was a man up there on the cross. Uh, a bunch of, I guess it was red uh, blood-like paint or something on him. He was hanging on the cross there at Pleasant Ridge and uh, Highway 14 up here. And there was some church down the road, and I stopped and talked to him a little bit about what was going on, and and, uh, you know, and it was one of their church members was doing this, and it said on the sign, it said, Jesus did this for you. And uh, as I left, I was thinking, you know what? If that was real, mm. and it used to be real, there's times that they, they, I mean, that they, they crucified people all the time, the Romans did. You'd be going down the road into town, and you'd see people crucified, hanging on crosses, dying, bleeding, suffering, um, and nobody there to care. And uh, so when I left, I thought, you know, uh, I, I, is that too much or what? I don't know. But, you know, as I left, I was thinking, that's, that's quite something there because there was times that uh, in, in some places in the world, even in England, uh, where if you were a criminal, they would just hang you up someplace and you'd walk through town and you'd see bodies hanging there. It was very cruel. It was very uh, uh, just a horrible sight to see. Um, and here they did that. And so I'm thinking, you know, what if uh, you really did see Jesus Christ hanging on the cross back in that day? You were standing there looking up at him. There he is on the cross. There he is nailed to the cross, his hands and his feet, crown of thorns on his head, the blood dripping down. 
And uh, there's the Son of God dying for my sins. Right. That'd be quite something. That'd be a scene to behold, wouldn't it? The Bible can only paint a picture of it. But uh, that kind of really brought it home to me a little bit the other day as I thought about it. I thought, well, that, that really does make it feel more real. When you see something like that, and just to think, what if it was real? At times it was in history. Um, now, um, look here again as we read here, verse 35, and they crucified him. Uh, and they parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture they did cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there. And set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land under the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, this will be like three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, This man calleth for Elias. That is, they misunderstood what he said. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, went unto the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly this was the Son of God. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day and for your blessings. We thank you, God, for the reading of the scripture this morning and the truth of it. We pray, God, you might bless the message now as we preach it. May it be a blessing to those that hear it. We pray, God, that you might uh, reveal yourself and your sons to someone today, Lord, who's lost in need of Christ as their Savior, and they might be born again. Bless your people. Help us, God, to remember what you've done for us. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so I'm going to talk to you this morning about the dying words of Jesus. The dying words of Jesus. Uh, of course, Matthew here is one of the four inspired narratives of the life and death of Jesus Christ. Uh, each of the Gospels complements one another and contributes to the full picture of the event that we just read about. And in this message, I want to preach to you about the last words, the dying words of Jesus Christ. Uh, last words are very important many times. Uh, some people have said some famous last words. Uh, books have been written about the last words of people. One that you might want to uh, check out is called The Last Words of Saints and Sinners. It talks about saved people and lost people and how they died and the last words they spoke before they took their last breath. Um, a man's dying words are usually the most important if he's in his right mind. And Jesus here, he refused painkiller. You know, sir, they offer him uh, vinegar with gall to drink there, and that was probably some kind of a painkiller. And he refused that. Uh, he didn't take it, even though the Roman soldiers offered it to him. And so in doing that, he endured all the agony of the crucifixion while fully conscious and completely aware of his suffering. And when you study the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you study the, the end of those books where it deals with the uh, history of his crucifixion and resurrection, uh, there's seven famous sayings that Jesus spoke from the cross as he hung there between heaven and earth, dying for our sins. Uh, if the dying words of mortal men are important, then certainly the words of one who claimed to be the Son of God would be even more important. And we're going to look at those words today and see what kind of significance we can find in those. So this morning we're going to preach to you and examine the final sayings of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. If you want to, look at Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. And here's the first thing we're going to look at. Luke chapter 23 and verse number 34. 
as uh, the uh, soldiers were uh, mocking him and, uh, and as they were uh, uh, gambling over his things and nailing him to the cross, uh, the Bible says here in Luke 23 and verse number 34, Jesus said this. If you've got a red letter edition Bible, of course, it's in red. Then said Jesus, hanging from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. They just gambled over him. And so these men have just nailed him to the cross, and they're crucifying him. And he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Uh, this is a saying of forgiveness said by the Lord Jesus Christ, and it shows His grace and His mercy. Uh, throughout His life on this earth, Jesus Christ forgave people of their sins. In His death, He forgave even those who nailed Him to the cross. Uh, Jesus didn't hold a grudge. He didn't harbor ill feelings toward those who wronged Him throughout His life or even in His death. He still had mercy and compassion on people. And the Bible tells us in the book of Psalms, in one place it said this, For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive. Uh, God is ready to forgive anyone who will come to Him. Amen. And uh, what a lesson it is for us to learn how to forgive and be forgiven. Amen. Jesus here, His enemies are surrounding Him. Uh, they're mocking Him. Many people, these soldiers here, may not even have known really who He was. They were just That was their job was to crucify people. They probably did it all day long. And they were callous toward these things, toward these people. They didn't know anything about them. It's just like somebody, if, uh, if you were to uh, say you got arrested for something uh, and maybe uh, uh, you really were innocent, uh, the people that are going to take you into the system don't really care about that. They just assume that you're guilty. And that's what they assumed about Jesus Christ. He's just another Jew that's guilty of some crime against the state and we're just going to crucify him, be done with him. The world will be a better place when he's gone. That's how they were looking at it. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In other words, he was saying they didn't probably realize he was the Son of God. But later on there, the centurion did know who he was. We just read that. When he, when he died on the cross, the centurion said, Surely this was the Son of God. So maybe they had some idea who he was, but they really didn't believe it maybe. But when Jesus died, that centurion looked up and he said, Surely this was the Son of God. And that was blasphemy because the Son of God was Caesar. And for a military man like that to say that this was the Son of God, that would be to deny that Caesar was the Son of God. So it seems that that soldier probably got saved on the spot there. But in any case, he forgave these people who crucified him. I read a, uh, where Richard Wormbrand, who wrote uh, Torture for Christ, tells of a woman whose father was murdered by the communists. And that's going on again today, by the way, Amen. Uh, a woman's father was murdered by the communists uh, over there in the Soviet Union. And the man who executed her father uh, one night came to a Bible study that she was at. Uh, he came in there seeking God, seeking the Lord, and he wanted to get forgiven and get saved. This guy was under conviction for the things he'd done and how he had been persecuting people, especially Christians. And uh, so he came into the Bible study. And uh, when he came in, he didn't know who she was, but he spoke to her about attending the Bible study. And so she thought, well, his soul is in my hands, heaven or hell. I can show him how to be saved, I can lead him to Christ, or I can just not speak with him and let him die and go to hell for what he did to my parents, to my mother. And... Um, or her father, that is. And so this woman definitely needed God's strength and grace to forgive this man and to even lead him in a prayer of salvation. And uh, she thought this, if Christ can forgive those who crucified him, then I must forgive those who sinned against me. And she led him to Christ. Wow. She got saved. He got saved and was led to Christ by one a relative of one he had killed for the sake of Jesus Christ. She forgave. And we don't, and we look at ourselves in a way the world, I mean, has anybody ever wronged you? Done you wrong? Done you dirty? Uh, people done me that way. I'm sure they done you that way too. Uh, we've, got to, we've got to learn how to forgive Amen. in spite of all those things. It'll help us sleep better at night. Amen? Yeah. And it'll be more like the Lord. Uh, Booker T. Washington, who was born into slavery and uh, was uh, freed after the Civil War, uh, became one of the uh, ranking scientists uh, in America. He particularly was uh, involved in agriculture. And uh, he studied the peanut. 
Heard that story? Yeah. He studied the peanut and found something like 200 uses for the peanut. Um, and uh, he spoke to Congress and things like that. Well, he was a believer in Christ. And he said this, a man who was born into slavery and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, discriminated against and uh, spoke against uh, most of his life, many of his, of his lifetime. He said, quote, I am determined to permit no man to narrow or degrade my soul by making me hate him. Amen. That was a great statement by a man who knew what it meant to be hated. And uh, if you've never read his biography, it's not long, it's very short. Somebody recommended it, to, and here I forget who it was, and I read it, and tell you what, I reckon you ought to read his biography. You ought to read his biography. Uh, it said that we're never more like Jesus than when we forgive those who've wronged us. Ephesians 4.32, the apostle wrote and said this, Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. In other words, if Christ could forgive you, then you ought to be able to forgive anybody that's wronged you. That's hard to do sometimes. You need the grace of God to do that. And God will give you the strength to do that if you'll trust Him. Uh, Benjamin Franklin said this about forgiveness. He said, doing an injury puts you below your enemy. Revenging one makes you even with your enemy, but forgiving your enemy sets you above him. If you want to take the high road, you have to forgive can't hold a grudge, amen? Jesus Christ didn't hold a grudge. Jesus Christ forgave freely those there who crucified him, and they didn't even know what they were doing. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Uh, number two, let me say this. Here's the second saying of Jesus Christ. Look at John chapter 19. John chapter 19. And look here at uh, verse number 26 and 27. John 19, verse 26 and 27. Here he is hanging on the cross, and while he's doing that, um, look at verse number 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, there's Mary, and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by him whom he loved, and we assume that that one that's, whom he loved is John who wrote the Gospel of John, when Jesus therefore saw his mother, Mary, and the disciples standing by whom he loved, that's John, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her into his own home. Uh, this was what we might call the saying of affection. Uh, this is showing and demonstrating the love and compassion of Jesus Christ for those that he loved. Uh, and here he says to Mary, he says, Woman, behold thy son. And now, now that would be a great text to preach on about beholding me, your son, down on the cross. But that's not what he meant in context. He's saying, Behold your son, and that's John. And John, behold your mother. And he's basically saying, I'm going to uh, give my mother to you, John, to care for when I leave. Mm. He wanted to do something for his mother. Jesus, though he was God manifest in the flesh, still had a special affection for his human mother, Mary. He knew her as the one who gave him birth and brought him into this world. Uh, the one who suckled him as an infant, the one who nurtured him as a child, the one who saw him through his teenage years and into young adulthood, the one who watched him grow into a man and carry on the trade of his father, uh, and then watched his fame grow throughout the land until he was betrayed and crucified before her very eyes. The Bible said that Mary would feel as though a sword had pierced her own soul. And here is where she was plunged, where that sword was plunged deeper into her heart when she heard and saw the people mocking and degrading her son as he died on the cross. Mm -hmm. You imagine Jesus died on the cross, we talked about him, but think about his mother watching her son die on the cross. So Jesus sees to it that she's taken care of and that she has a home and a family after he's gone. So Mary takes John as her son, and John takes Mary in just like his own mother. So it's a saying of affection. He loved his mother, and he wanted his mother to be taken care of. Uh, President William McKinley, who was assassinated in 1901 in Buffalo, New York, stipulated in his will that above all else, his mother should be provided for and made comfortable for the rest of her life. Uh, he put her in the will, and he said, when I die, he didn't, know he, was he didn't know he was going to be assassinated, but he said, I want my mother to live in comfort, and I want her to be taken care of to the best of my ability when I'm gone. Um, we don't know what happened to Joseph, the mother of Mary. 
and uh, the stepfather, if you will, of the Lord Jesus Christ. But no doubt, he's probably died by this time, or I'm, I assume he would be there. And so therefore, Mary is a widow. And she has no one to take her in, no one to care for her. And so Jesus Christ, one of his last words is, take care of my mother. Um, what about her other children? Somebody might ask. Well, we know from the Bible that Jesus Christ had at least four brothers and at least two sisters. And so what about them? And, of course, they were half-brothers and half-sisters. But her other sons and daughters, uh, we read the Bible, had not yet believed in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. At this point, none of his brothers or sisters had believed in him as the Messiah, as the Christ, as the Son of God. They doubted him, and uh, they have simply just tolerated him to this point. But none of them have believed yet. And so when Jesus is about to die, he wants his mother to be taken into a believer's home rather than an unbelieving home, even though they were her family. You know what? There's a difference between a saved family and a lost family. There's a difference between a saved family member and a lost family member. I mean, sometimes we're closer to our brothers and sisters in Christ than some of our own people in the flesh. That's because of what we believe about, about the Bible, about Jesus Christ. And there is a difference between, there's a difference in the atmosphere, things like that. Um, so the Lord Jesus Christ wants his mother taken care of. So even as Jesus Christ was dying on the cross, he was obeying the law of God and that he was honoring his father and his mother, and particularly his mother here. He was practicing the fifth commandment by honoring his parents. Uh, by the way, let me say this though, he did not honor her like some worldwide religion does, amen, that makes her the mother of all Christians and the co-mediator with Christ and our way to Jesus. Mary is not the way to Jesus. Jesus is the way to God, and the way to Jesus is by faith. You go to him directly. He said, come unto me, all you labor. He didn't say, come to my mother. He said, come unto me. So we don't go through Mary for anything. Matter of fact, if you went to Mary, Mary would say, well, just do what he said do. Amen. Matter of fact, that's what she did say in the Bible. She said, they came to her, she said, she said well, just do what he said to do. That's Mary's command. Do what he said do, which was what? Come to him by faith, and be saved and forgiven. Amen? But he had a saying of affection for his mother. He loved his family. Not only that, but look at Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. Look at this, and look at uh, verse number 43 around here. Verse 43. Uh, you read here, we read here that uh, uh, about these two thieves. And Matthew said there was two thieves there, and they railed against him. But in Luke, we find out that something happened while they were hanging on that cross before they both died. Look at verse 39. One of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we have received the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. These malefactors, these criminals, they knew that Jesus Christ was innocent. And uh, verse 42, and so this one thief here, the one who is uh, taking up for Christ, he says to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And here's the saying, and Jesus said to him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. I believe we could call this the saying of salvation. That is here God... Jesus Christ had died on the cross, and he redeems this man and gives him assurance. And he said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Makes a statement. Uh, Jesus fulfilled the prophecy that he would die with the wicked. Uh, back in Isaiah, it said he would die with the wicked. And here he is, crucified between two thieves. Um, there's a joke that goes along this, if you can say a joke. A dying man one time requested his banker and his lawyer to be at his bedside. And so the banker and the lawyer came to his bedside as he was dying, and they said, why did you ask for us to come? He said, because I wanted to die like Jesus between two thieves. Amen? All right. So there's your lawyer joke. Amen? Um, now, there were three crosses that day. And... Uh, in a sense, there still is today. In the, on the middle cross was Jesus Christ. He was the Lord, the Savior, the Redeemer. There was Jesus Christ hanging on that middle cross. 
He had no sin in him, but he had sin on him. The Bible said the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so he had no sin within him. He had no sin. He, he didn't have a sin nature. He didn't commit sin. He didn't think sin, do sin. But the sins of the world were laid upon him. And then you had another sinner on one side. And this one is one who rejected the Redeemer and mocked him and ridiculed him. And this one who rejected him had sin on him and in him. That's an unsaved man. You've got to get rid of your sin if you're going to be saved. And here's another sinner, the other thief on the other side of Jesus Christ. Uh, he's the one who received Christ. And so he had sin in him, but he didn't have sin on him when he died. Because Christ took that sin because God laid his iniquity on Christ. And God has laid your iniquity on Christ, your sins upon him. And if you want to be saved, you simply have to accept what he did in your behalf for you. Amen? Um, you take this thief that died on the cross. We call him the dying thief. And we use him many times as an illustration of how salvation is so simple and doesn't depend on your works. Here's a man who's died on the cross. Uh, we don't know if he was a Roman or a Jew, but if he was a Jew, then uh, of course he, uh, uh, to be right with God, he would have had to be one who was faithful to uh, you know, go to the temple and worship God and offer his sacrifices and things like that. But it doesn't look like he did that. If he was a Jew, he wasn't a very good Jew. That's why he's hanging on the cross. He's a thief. So we know he didn't do that. So we know he's a sinner, that's for sure. He's definitely a sinner. And so here he is hanging on this cross, and he realizes that he doesn't have much time left. Pretty soon he's going to be dead. And when he dies, he believes in heaven or hell, apparently, and he wants to go to paradise. And he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He recognizes he's Lord. The Bible said, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, he did. He called upon the name of the Lord, and God saved him. He said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Well, when he died on that cross there, guess what? He didn't have time to get baptized. There was nobody there to give him the sacraments. Uh, there was no good work that he could perform at this point. Uh, he couldn't join the church at this point. There's nothing he can do. He's just simply ready to die here shortly, and he's going to go into eternity. And so he looks to Jesus Christ, and apparently he's under conviction. He realizes that I'm a sinner. I am so I, I'm suffering justly for what I've done, but this man's done nothing amiss. And so the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ died for us, he the just, for us the unjust. That he might reconcile us to God. Amen. That's what Jesus did that for. Amen. And so uh, I heard a man say this. He said he, he kind of gave a, 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 a kind of a fictional scenario and he talked about uh, this dying thief showing up at the pearly gates. And when he got to the pearly gates, uh, the angel there said, or I guess it's supposed to be si I guess it's Simon Peter, amen. It's not really true, but that's what they say, right? But uh, here, you know, the angel asked him at the gates, or Simon Peter, whoever it is there at the gate, asked him, said, well, you know, by what right do you have to come in here? How is it that you're coming to the gates of heaven and expect to enter in? What have you done to do this? He said, I haven't done anything. And he said, well, why are you here? Why do you expect to come in? He said, well, the man on the middle cross down there said I could come. Amen. 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 He said, today thou shalt be in paradise. See what? That man went to heaven, if you will, the same day and the same moment that he died down that cross. He was saved. So God can save anybody. Let me say this. Don't get saved on your dying breath. Right. Amen. Because you may not have that opportunity. But you can be saved in the very end if you, well, that is if you want to be saved. Right. You know, sometimes you get to the place where you don't have the desire to be saved. Here's two men hanging on the cross on either side of Jesus Christ. One man over here is still full of bitterness and hatred and contempt for Christ. Here's the other guy over here thinking, you know what? I'm a sinner. This guy's innocent. Man, this guy, there's something different about him. And he must have recognized he was the Lord. He must have recognized and known that they were crucifying him because he said he was the Son of God. And so he must have believed that he was the Son of God by being with him while he's even hanging on the cross there. He recognized there was something different about him. And so he believes he's the Messiah. He believes he's the Savior. And so he, under conviction there, and realizes he's a sinner and he's about to die and go into eternity... And meet God, wants to be right with God before he dies. And so he gets saved there on the cross, and then it's probably not some hours later, and he's dead. 
Well, both of those men were thieves. Both of them were criminals. Both of them were convicted. Both of them were condemned. Both of them were about to die. One of them got saved. One of them didn't. You know why? Because one of them's heart was tender towards God, and the other one was hardened. This guy wanted to be saved. This guy wanted nothing to do with it. So, you're, you're, you're one of the two camps. You're on, the, on one side of the cross, the other side of the cross. You're one who wants to receive him and has done so, or one who has rejected him and doesn't want him. But here is a saying of salvation. So again, where are you in the picture? You're either a sinner who's rejecting Christ, or you're a sinner who has received him as your personal Savior. And so you're on one cross or the other, and Jesus is in the middle. Amen? That's the saying of salvation. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Assurance, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. You're going to be in heaven with me today. And if you'll trust Christ, guess where you're going to be when you die? You're going to be with him. Amen. He said, Today you'll be with me. And wherever Jesus is, that is heaven. Amen? Look at Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. And look here at verse number 46. Verse number 46. Verse 46. We read this earlier. Matthew 27, 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's the saying. This we could call the saying of grief. Here we see Jesus Christ in his sorrow and his anguish. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know what? Sometimes people use God's name in, a, in such a way it's not doesn't, doesn't sound necessarily like a cuss word. Uh, you know, we're not putting the other, you know, we're not adding to that name to make it a cuss word. But sometimes the people will use God's name to simply, oh God, this and that, whatever. Um, and they use it sometimes very flippantly. But you know what happens when you really get in trouble? When you really find yourself in a place where you don't think there's a way out and you could possibly be in a real, I mean, you could be facing prison, you could be facing death, you might die in the next few minutes, you don't know what's going on. Uh, you're in pain and, and, you're in, and you're in anguish over something that just happened to you. And you know what you do? What your final resort is at that point? My God, my God. Dear God, help me. You know what you're doing? You're crying out for God. Yeah. There's just something within us that when we start to suffer and we know there's no place, nobody else that can help us and we're by ourselves, you, we call out to God. Amen. We call out to God. Yeah. Um, Richard Warnbrand, and again, the man who wrote Torture for Christ, I read where he was saying that he was on a train one time, and there was a Soviet communist officer sitting across from him on the train, and uh, they were in a conversation or something, and, and Warnbrand uh, uh, said to him, he said something to the effect of, uh, um, didn't you pray to God in the foxhole? And the man looked at him, he said, how did you know? He said, did somebody tell you? He said, no, nobody told me that. I just know that when you're in a foxhole and you're about to die, you cry out to God. Even if you're an atheist. And so he cried out to God. Jesus here cries out to his Father. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? At this time, Jesus is experiencing total separation from his Father. Not just physically, but now emotionally and spiritually. You ever heard of uh, separation anxiety? You know, children get that for their parents. Parents get that for their children and grandchildren, things like that. And when uh, people are no longer around or they leave or whatever, for whatever reason, maybe move away or something, you know, sometimes there's some separation anxiety there. And that is because they're gone. Uh, you take a little child, and I'll use Noah as a situation here. I mean, we leave the room, he's suffering separation anxiety. <laughs> we're, just across, we're just outside the room, outside, outside the door. Sometimes he's like, "Mama, Dad, Dad, where are you at?" You know, and um, anyway, um, they uh, uh, and here's Jesus Christ. I believe this. You could call this possibly some kind of maybe a divine separation anxiety. He suffered not just physically, but now emotionally and spiritually. Because why? Because he said, "God, why have you forsaken me?" Well, I believe here's the answer. Habakkuk one thirteen. The Bible says this about God. It says that God is of purer eyes. That to behold evil and cannot look on iniquity. Now think about what Jesus did. The Bible said that God hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Bible said that Jesus Christ became sin for us who knew no sin. 
And so here's Jesus Christ. He's become sin for us. Here's Jesus Christ. God's laid the iniquity of the entire world, every sin of every sinner who ever lived, on Jesus Christ. And he's become sin for us. And the Bible says that God is so pure that he cannot look on iniquity. So at that point there, he couldn't look at his own son, Jesus Christ. Why? Because he was bearing the sins of the world. So at this time, Jesus Christ is forsaken by his own Father as he bears our sins. And again, no doubt, it's this point that Jesus Christ became sin for us, became a curse for us, and he literally becomes the sin offering that is offered in our behalf. At this time, all ties to heaven are severed with his heavenly Father, and he's totally alone, abandoned by a man and now his own Father, God himself. He's completely alone. You ever felt that way? Jesus Christ did it at this point. Now, let me ask you this question. If God would abandon his only Son because he had taken our sins upon him and even became sin for us and couldn't look on his own Son at that point, even though he was the sinless Son of God, but he was bearing our sins. If God can't look at his own Son because of the sin that was upon him, how do you think that you're going to get past the judgment yourself as a sinner? Right. I mean, Jesus Christ was pure, holy, righteous, without sin, but he was bearing our sins. Mm -hmm. And God couldn't look at him. Mm. You expect God to look at you and let you in? Apart from what Jesus Christ did for you? It's not going to happen. Amen. But that's the saying of grief. He was grieving over the fact that he had lost fellowship with his father for those several hours as he hung there on the cross. Look at uh, John chapter 19. John chapter 19. John 19 again. And in John chapter 19... Look at, um, look at verse number 28. Verse number 28. This is right after he says, Behold thy son and behold thy mother. In the previous verses, and in verse 28, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, this is what he said, I thirst. I thirst. Uh, now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it into his mouth. Put it to his mouth. But, and he received it there in verse number 30. He received it that time. But now, first time he rejected it, the second time he received it. But now notice this. We might call this the saying of suffering. We see here his pain and his agony. He said, I thirst. I thirst. Uh, in life, Jesus thirsted. He hungered. He got tired. Uh, he was a human being like us. He suffered the same pressures and temptations and feelings and stresses that we do in our lives. <laughs> Uh, Jesus did and he can relate to the sinner's condition without participating in that sin uh, and giving in to it. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 53, it says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He understood what it was to be despised and to be rejected and to have sorrow. And he was acquainted with grief. So he understands your grief and mine. Amen. Amen. And uh, he can feel your pain, if you will. It says on the book of the uh, Hebrews. Hebrews 4.15 says this, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He said this high priest is touched with the feeling of our infirmities, our weaknesses, our sicknesses, our shortcomings, our sins. He is touched with the feeling of our infirmities as he feels for us. Amen? He sympathizes with you and I. Even though he uh, is touched with the thing of our infirmities, it says this, he was at all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Amen. He was tempted like we are, but he never gave it to sin. He never committed a sin. In thought, word, or deed. Amen. He was perfect, holy, and sinless. Amen. So he can relate to the sinner's condition without participating in the sin. Not only did he suffer with us in life, but he also suffered for us in death. The book of Isaiah goes on to say, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. 
All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. So he suffered shame, he suffered humiliation, rejection, uh, and uh, uh, many Bible scholars believe that when Jesus Christ was on the cross there and he quoted part of Psalm 22, which is, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Many people think that he possibly quoted the entire psalm hanging on the cross there, but it just wasn't recorded. And when you read Psalm 22, you read that, you're reading about his experience on the cross and what was going on while he was hanging on the cross and what was going on around him as he hung on that cross. And the thing about Psalm 22 is it's describing his crucifixion a thousand years before anybody ever even thought of crucifixion. It's prophecy. Now, if you study the Roman method of crucifixion, of course it's very cruel and it's a horrifying experience. Um, Jesus Christ suffered the pain. He endured the agonies of hell for us while on the cross. And I believe that may be what's hinted at here when he says, I thirst. It reminds me of the rich man in hell who couldn't get one drop of water. Remember that? Not one drop of water. And here's Jesus Christ saying, I thirst. I thirst. He's hot. Uh, uh, he's, he's feeling the agonies and the pain of the cross and dehydration and all these things that go with it. And he's thirsting. He needs a drink. And nobody gives him any water. They give him vinegar. Well, um, when we think of the crucifixion, let me just say this also. Uh, and, and some people, they're skeptics, will bring this up. They say, well, you know, people were crucified all the time under Rome. That's true. People suffer the, the horrors of dying on a cross just like Jesus did. That's true. But only one of them was the Son of God who died for your sins in your place who was perfectly innocent. Amen. And that was Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So he died for you and me in our place, and he died the death of a sinner in our place so that we can have eternal life. Now look at John chapter 19. John chapter 19 also again. And look down here as we keep reading. Look at verse number 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. Now look what he said in verse 28. Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. And then in verse 30, it says there, because he knew things were accomplished, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Here is the sixth saying. We could call it the saying of victory. It is finished. Here is the triumph and the conquest of the cross. Amen, amen. Uh, it's finished. Uh, a little bit about the Old Testament. Under the Old Testament economy, the believer had to bring an offering to the temple. And there the priest would offer it to God for him. This was in view of the coming Redeemer. His sins were forgiven, but he wasn't saved yet. The lambs of Israel pictured the coming of the Lamb of God, who would not just cover our sins, but would take them away fully, finally, and forever. The Old Testament believer had to bring an offering every year, and the priest offered sacrifices every day of the year, and their work was ongoing and continuous, and the priest's work was never done. Well, when Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, uh, made that perfect sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, which we've been reading about this morning, the price of our redemption was fully, finally, and forever paid. Amen. Uh, when Jesus cried, it's finished. Uh, uh, many people say that uh, he used the word, and it's true, called tetelestai. If you study the Romans, you find that that word was used frequently in business. And when a person bought something and paid for it, the seller would give him a sales receipt with the word telestai written on it. Today, if you do that and you pay for something, they'll write on, they'll get, have a stamp that says, paid in full. It's finished. You're done. Uh, it's a done deal. Uh, and what he's saying here is that your redemption has been completed. Your salvation is finished. There's nothing more to do. And so it's a done deal. Uh, our salvation is not to be continued or added to. He said it's finished. So everything that was required for you to be saved was done when Jesus Christ died on the cross. Um, our salvation, again, is not something that we continue to work at because Jesus Christ already did the work. Amen? And go back to the thief on the cross. What happened to him? He got saved without doing anything. Had a repentant heart, and he believed on the Lord. And he received him as his Savior, just like we do today. So our salvation has been bought, it's been paid for in full by the blood 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we sang about the blood in Sunday school this morning. Amen? Um, a man came to a preacher one time. He was under conviction of his sin. And he came to the preacher and he said to the preacher, he said, what must I do to be saved? And the preacher said, I'm sorry, man, it's too late. He said, what do you mean it's too late? He said, it's too late for you to do anything. He said, how can that be? He said, because it's already been done. And the man accepted Christ and his finished work on the cross of Calvary for his salvation. That's what you did when you got saved. Whether you know it or not, when you call on Jesus Christ to save you, know what you did, you put your faith and trust in him and what he did for you on the cross in your behalf to save and forgive you. That's what happened, see? So it's a saying of victory. It's finished. So that's the victor's cry when he dies on the cross. It's not the, it's not the cry of a victim, but it's the cry of a victor. Amen? Amen. And we'll see why here in a couple of days. Amen? Look at uh, Luke 23. Luke chapter 23. One more time here. Luke 23. And um, here's the final and the seventh saying of Jesus Christ from the cross. Luke 23 and verse number 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, that said, and when Jesus cried with a loud voice, he said, it doesn't say as you read this that he cried with a loud voice and said this. It said when he had cried. He apparently said something before this. I think what he said before this was probably maybe it was um, in conjunction with it's finished. Look what he says here. And when Jesus cried with a loud voice, it is finished. Then he said this, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. He gave up his life. And his life departed from him at that moment. You think about people, if you've ever been around anybody that's died, and you see the last breath they take, or the last breath that they release, and uh, that ghost, that's the ghost. That's the spirit of the man. It's gone. And you know what? There's a life force within us. It's our soul and our spirit. And there's something about when you're around somebody who has died, that soul's not there anymore. It's just a shell of the man that was there or the woman that was there before. And they were either saved or lost when they died. And some people hang on to life as long as they can. And at some point after the struggle, they may say to themselves in their mind, I've had enough. I'm going to quit fighting. And they give up the ghost and die. Here's Jesus Christ. He's not, he's not fighting against death here. He's warring against it, but he's not fighting it in the sense he's trying to fend off death. He's ready to give his life. He's not trying to fend off death. He's ready to die. That's what he came to do. And so in doing this, he says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he gave up the ghost. That would be a good way to die, amen? Mm -hmm. If you ever come to that place where it's your time to die, that would be a good way to die and say, you know, you could say, in a sense, my life is finished. I've done all I can do for the Lord. And now, dear God, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And you're in paradise. You're in the presence of Jesus Christ, amen? You're saved. And so the door of death really is a door into heaven for those of us that are saved. Now, Jesus Christ, of course, did not fear death. He didn't fear eternity, and he didn't regret the life that he lived or the sacrifice they made. So he could die in peace and satisfaction and die with what we might call the saying of contentment. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Hebrews 12 says this, that Jesus Christ, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. That is Jesus Christ on the cross. He endured the shame of the cross. He despised that shame, but he did it because there was joy set before him. That is, he understood the result of his death on the cross was going to bring joy, amen, to heaven and to the souls of those who have been saved. Uh, Jesus did what he was meant to do, and he finished the work that he'd come to do when he said these words, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He died in peace and satisfied that he'd done what he came to do, and his mission was accomplished. Amen? Now, every biography that I've ever read ends with the death of the hero and a summation of his or her legacy. But when I read the four biographies of Jesus Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the Gospels, I find that the final chapter is not about his death. 
but it's about his resurrection, amen? amen. In the biographies of Jesus Christ, he dies, but then he comes back to life, amen? Mm -hmm. He resurrects from the dead. Uh, God in the Bible didn't leave Jesus Christ on the cross. Uh, when you read the Bible, it doesn't leave him in the tomb, and neither should we, amen? The Lord Jesus Christ is no longer on the cross. He's no longer in the tomb. But that tomb is empty today. Why? Because He's gone. Amen? Amen. He's risen, is what the Bible tells us. And we believe that He did rise from the dead. Amen? And uh, we believe that He rose from the dead for our justification, that we could be saved. He died on the cross for our sins. He rose again. And that was God's amen to His death on the cross that God said, I have accepted this sacrifice in behalf of every sinner who will trust my Son as their Savior. Amen? Um, uh, an old preacher, he's dead now, wrote this poem called He Wouldn't Stay Dead. This is a good poem. He said, They laid his body in Joseph's new tomb and filled his disciples with sorrow and gloom. They did not remember what he had said, that he would die, but he wouldn't stay dead. Mary came at the break of day and found the stone was rolled away. She saw an angel in terror and fled and told his disciples that he didn't stay dead. In that cold, dark tomb, he would not stay. He conquered death and walked away. And now that old grave has lost its fear and dread, he lives again because he wouldn't stay dead. Full atonement and pardon were made, and forever the sin debt is marked, fully paid. The price was his blood as it flowed crimson red, and I'm thankful today that he didn't stay dead. Let's go to our churches and cry aloud. Let's go to the marketplace and talk to the crowd. Let's go to the mission fields that lie up ahead and tell the whole world that Jesus didn't stay dead. Amen? Amen. That's a blessing to know that. Amen? You think all the religions in the world, they say all religions are the same. No, they're not. In my religion, my, the founder of my religion didn't stay dead. Amen? Right. I can't go to his grave and worship him and honor him and, and sorrow for him. Whatever. I can't because he's not there. Right. His grave is empty. Jesus said some other words after his death and resurrection. He said this in the book of Revelation. He said, Fear not, I am the last and the first. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. He said, I, he said, I'm alive. He said, I lived at one time, and then I died. He said, But behold, I'm alive forevermore now. Then he said, Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. Uh, Jesus said in one place in John 14, verse 19, he said this. He said, in reference to his resurrection and our salvation, he said this. He said, because I live, ye also shall live. Amen. In other words, if Jesus Christ rises from the dead, we'll rise from the dead. If Jesus Christ lives eternally, even after he died, we're going to live eternally after we die, if we miss the rapture. Amen? If we die before the rapture. So, because he lives... You can't just, it's not just because he lives I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, I'm going to live also forever and ever in eternity. Amen. In the presence of God. Amen. And I'll close with this thought here. Jesus Christ was ready to meet, was ready to meet God as the Son of God. He was the Son of God. And you know what? He was ready to meet his Heavenly Father after he died. Now let me say this. When you're saved and you know Christ is your Savior, guess what? You're ready to meet God as a born-again child of God. Amen. And there is no fear of eternity and what lies beyond death if you know Christ is your Savior. Again, Jesus, as the Son of God, was ready to meet His Heavenly Father. I and you, as children of God, born again by faith in Christ, guess what? We're ready to meet God. And there's no fear. The Bible said perfect love cast out fear. Now, if you're afraid of dying, you're afraid of what lies beyond the grave, then you probably need to get saved. Because Jesus said this, he said, fear not. He said, I was alive, I was dead, behold, I'm alive forevermore. And because I live, you're going to live for eternity, amen? And guess what? We're going to be saved and forgiven and living in eternity until God dies. <laughs> well, guess what? He's not going to die amen. because he lives forevermore, amen? Right. So our salvation is as good as the life of the Lord Jesus Christ resurrected and at the right hand of the Father even today. The question is, are you saved today? Will you be in heaven in eternity? Are you ready to meet God? Do you know Christ is your Savior? These seven sayings here of Jesus Christ are very famous. Everybody should know these sayings and study them out. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed as Brother Matt comes and plays an invitational hymn for us.
Our Father, we thank you, God, for an opportunity we have to come to church this morning and, Father, to uh, preach and emphasize the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and not only that, his death on the cross for us. We thank you for the gospel, that is, that Christ died for us, that he was buried and he rose again the third day for our justification. We thank you, God, that Jesus Christ loved us enough and that, God, you loved us enough to allow your Son to come into this world to live a sinless life and to die on the cross on our behalf and pay the sin debt that we couldn't pay. We pray, God, there's anybody among us, whether it's in church today or online listening to this service today or any other time in the future, that, God, if they're not saved, not ready to meet you, we pray, God, that, uh, Father, you might, uh, Lord, touch their heart, reveal yourself to them. We pray, God, that they might, uh, Lord, feel the need of their forgiveness and desire salvation. They would come to Christ and, Lord, uh, Lord, receive that salvation that's been finished on the cross for him or her. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. While the piano plays and our heads are bowed right now, uh, and the Christians are praying, uh, maybe you're here today and uh, you've heard the gospel before. You've heard about Jesus Christ dying for you and rising again. But maybe it's never really touched your heart like it ought to. Maybe you're here today thinking that you're a Christian, thinking that you're okay, but maybe after the message today, you realize that you can't get to heaven on your own, no matter how good, no matter how good a person you are, or how good a person uh, you are compared to other people. Uh, God's standard of perfection is His Son, Jesus Christ, as we said a while ago. If Jesus, if God can't look at His own Son, because he's bearing our sins. How can he look on us who are sinners indeed? Our sins need to be forgiven. They can only be forgiven one way, and that's by what Jesus did for us. Down on the cross, in your place, paying the penalty for us. If we reject that gift, if we reject that salvation, then we're doomed to an eternity without God, without Christ, without life, in a place called hell. Jesus Christ and God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants everyone to be saved. The only thing that stands between you and salvation is a stubborn will. You need to give it over to the Lord. Yield yourself to Him and trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. You've never done that. The Bible says, Who so shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if God's dealing in your heart, you understand that you're lost, unsaved, unforgiven, and there's nothing you can do to save yourself. And you realize today that everything that needs to be done to save you has been done by Jesus Christ on the cross. If you'll accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, He will save you if you'll trust Him today. The heads bowed and mouths closed. Let me just ask you this question. People praying, how many in this room could raise your hand by raising your hand and saying, Brother David, I know a shadow of a doubt that if I were to die today I would be with Christ in paradise in heaven because I have trusted him as my Savior I know my sins are forgiven I know I've got eternal life I know I'm saved would you raise your hand I raise your hand and say Brother David I know in my heart that I'm saved I'm ready put your hands down I can't see everybody here but I just say this if you can't raise your hand because you're not saved, or maybe you're doubting your salvation, you don't have assurance. If you if you ever trusted Christ as your Savior, you're saved. You need to get the Bible and find out why. You get that assurance that you need. But if you've never truly trusted Christ as your Savior, and God's in your heart today, today is the day of salvation. Today is the time to accept Him as your Savior. And I want you to do that before you leave today. Father, we thank you for this day and your blessings. We ask God that you would, uh, Lord, uh, bless the message that you preach this morning. We pray, God, that you might use it, Lord, in the lives of each and every one here today who's heard it, including myself, and, Lord, those that might hear it online today or in the future. I pray, God, that this gospel that's eternal and, Lord, never change, and that, God, uh, it would, that they would hear the message and, Lord, they would trust Jesus as their Savior and be born again, and then we would hear about it. I pray, God, now that you dismiss us with your blessings. Uh, Lord, be with those that could be here today. And Father, we pray you might bless our meal that we're about to partake of this afternoon. Bless our fellowship, and we'll thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. And we're dismissed. <laughs>